Devai Jakob was first published in Hamburg in 1879, but within a year the city authorities banned it for its overtly socialist political stance. But it was resuscitated by the journalist Wilhelm Bloss and publisher Johann Dietz in 1884 in Stuttgart. And this second incarnation of the magazine was tolerated, if not exactly welcomed, by the authorities there. At this stage, and for quite a few years to come, the illustrators who appeared in the magazine were uncredited, although the distinctive masthead was created by Otto Emil Lau. Devar Jakob was affected with the voice of the German Social Democratic Party, which had been established in the 1860s as a political entity leaning towards Marxist ideology, although it later came to occupy the centre-left. It had started out as a monthly publication, but its rapidly growing popularity led to it appearing weekly within a couple of years, and by 1890 the magazine even began to feature some fairly basic coloured illustrations on the cover. Not much later, as the quality of the printing began to improve, the interior pages also began to feature an increasing number of colour illustration. In addition to Lau, I managed to identify a handful of other contributors from their signatures or initials, and it seemed Lau was joined by Otto Marcus, whose emotionally charged work featured regularly at this time. And as the end of the 19th century grew closer, other talents began to make their mark, including Ferdinand Leek and Hans Gabriel Jensch. And although neither Leek or Marcus proved to be enduring contributors, Jensch would be a regular for years to come. Because of its defiant left-wing stance, every issue of the magazine was closely monitored by the police. But the prosecutor's office would have needed enough damning evidence of calls for political insurrection to indict the publishers. And Devar Jacob's editorial tone managed to stay just inside what were considered acceptable boundaries. The first decade of the 20th century was arguably the most productive and visually creative for Devar Jacob and many more illustrators joined its ranks during this period. Full-colour lithography had freed the illustrators from the previous restrictions on how their work could be reproduced, and this meant greater visual variety in the magazine's pages. Italian illustrator Gabriele Galantara, known by his alias Rattalanga, featured frequently from the turn of the century onwards. His own left-leaning political views chimed with De Var Jacobs, and for over a decade he appeared in its pages and on quite a few covers, as well as those of his own satirical magazine, Lastino. Willie Lehman Schramm seems to have joined the ranks around this time, and his particularly expressive fine linear style and acerbic humorous images made a worthy addition to the ongoing team of visual satirists. The continuing dominance of Otto Emil Lau's illustration strongly suggests he was a full-time staff artist, and it's possible that Jens was on the payroll too, but others were more than likely contributing on a freelance basis. During the decade, artists came and went, but the bold graphic cartoon style of Emil Erk was popular at this time, as was the distinctive grotesquerie of Max Vanzelow. And with a team of diverse talents, the pages and covers of the magazine positively bristled with visually eloquent satire, most of which confined itself to domestic German politics and the perceived injustices of the system, although there were occasional condemnations of other nations' shortcomings, and the Russian Tsar in particular came in for a lot of abuse. And finally, in 1910, Duvar Jakob actually started giving a printed typographic credit to its contributors, so I'm now pleased to be able to name them all from this point onwards. Oddly, very little of the magazine's imagery at this time made any reference to the imminence of war, although there were some allusions to the possibility of impending doom, and the first direct references came only once the war had actually begun. And although far from alone, the relative newcomer Arthur Kruger produced many war-themed images, some of which eloquently lamented the loss of life, and some of which vilified the Allies, and Britain in particular. Others also took a surprisingly patriotic stance and created similarly propagandist images. Due to the conflict, printing became restricted and full colour was abandoned, as most images were published with two colours at best. But this wasn't particularly to the detriment of the images created, and it could be said that it gave them greater graphic impact. At the outset of the war, Devar Jakob had boasted a circulation of around 400,000, 
But these numbers fell rapidly as the conflict continued, and by 1918 their readership had fallen to half that figure. By the end of the war, Arthur Kruger had become a ubiquitous presence in the magazine, and was as vital to its graphic identity as more established artists, some of whom had by now faded from view as they retired or died. Even so, more relative newcomers such as Willy Steinert were happy to fill the spaces left by the old guard in the post-war years. The reduced colour palette imposed during the conflict continued in the lean years that followed Germany's defeat, and like others, Devar Jakob struggled to continue publication. Much of the work created focused on the dismal living standards now prevailing in Germany, and this was visually abetted by a rather unreasonable resentment of the Allies and their determination to make Germany suffer. In late 1923, Devar Jakob ceased publication, but was replaced only a few months later in early 1924 by Lachen Links, which translates as laughter on the left. This too served as a mouthpiece for the Social Democrat Party, and why it was considered financially viable when Devar Jakob was not, I have no idea. But from the beginning, most of the former contributors no longer featured, and the new magazine's visual identity was taken over by a new core of illustrators who were arguably more modernist and broadly influenced by contemporary art, including Cubism and German Expressionism. Karl Halls was easily the most significant graphic presence, and he would remain a particularly dominant graphic force in the coming years, along with Hermann Aberking and Jakobus Belsen. And it was Aberking who made the earliest adverse visual reference to the presence of Hitler's National Socialists. And other than a couple of appearances by Willy Steinert, it was this trio with Holtz leading the charge who were the core team. But in 1927, Lack and Link suddenly reverted to being Devar Jakob again, and I'm as clueless as to why this came about as I am about its disappearance three years earlier. But despite its return to the original name, the illustrators who had risen to prominence in the years of Lack and Lynx, led by Karl Holtz, continued to be the most significant contributors into the 1930s. And they were joined on a regular basis at this point by both Willy Steinert and relative newcomer Willibald Crane. By this time, Adolf Hitler's National Socialist Party was making significant inroads into German politics. And despite their claim to be a true socialist party, Devar Jakob was firmly opposed to their ideological principles and methods from the very moment they began their inexorable rise. At this time, Devar Jakob wasn't the only magazine to express hostility to the Nazis, but it would soon be isolated as the only one which refused to change its tune for the sake of a quiet life. And the magazine continued to be a thorn in the Nazis' side, despite the obvious danger it put them in from this blatantly brutal and humorless political entity. During the political and social turmoil of Germany at this time, Devar Jakob's key contributors launched a series of relentlessly dissenting humorous images which mocked the Nazis' ideology and the specific shortcomings of its leaders, including Hitler himself. And inevitably in 1933, when the Nazis swept into power as the new German government, the Socialist Democratic Party was outlawed and Devar Jakob was shut down immediately. In the end, Devar Jakob and Lack and Lynx had a run of about 53 years, and I'm guessing that if it hadn't been for the rise of the Nazis, it would have been around considerably longer. Nevertheless, in its half-century of existence, it engaged the services of some remarkable graphic and satirical talents, and featured an equally remarkable diverse range of styles and techniques. The evidence or lack of it suggests that some of the group who had worked for the magazine in the late twenties and early thirties stopped working as illustrators once Devar Jakob was no more. Jakobus Belsen managed to leave Germany in 1936 to live in America, but died only a year later. Hermann Aberking died in unknown circumstances in 1939, and Willibald Crane only made it to 1945. But Karl Holtz started to have a few innocuous cartoons published in Fliegender Blätter, and Willy Steiner created similarly uncontentious drawings for the Austrian magazine Die Muskete. 
I have to say I find it astonishing that it was only a few years ago that I stumbled across Devar Jacob while actually looking for illustrators who'd worked for the far better known Simplicissimus. I would have imagined that its very resistance to the Nazi regime would have earned it a better place in history. And I hope that this video has gone some way towards it being better remembered, as much for its brave descent as for its considerable graphic legacy.